Please rise for the reading of the Gospel. On the last day of the festival, the great day, while Jesus was standing there, he cried out, Let anyone who is thirsty come to me, and let the one who believes in me drink. As the scripture has said, out of the believer's heart shall flow rivers of living water. Now he said this about the spirit, which believers in him were to receive. For as yet there was no spirit, because Jesus had not yet glorified. When they heard these words, some in the crowd said, This is really the prophet. Others said, This is the Messiah. But some asked, Surely the Messiah does not come from Galilee, does he? Was not the scripture said that the Messiah is descended from David and comes from Bethlehem, the village where David lived? So there was a division in the crowd because of him. Some of them wanted to arrest him, but no one laid hands on him. Then the temple police went back to the chief priests and Pharisees, who asked them, Why did you not arrest him? The police answered, Never has anyone spoken like this. Then the Pharisees replied, Surely you have not been deceived too, have you? Has any one of the authorities or the Pharisees believed in him? But this crowd which does not know the law, they are accursed. Nicodemus, who had gone to Jesus before, and who was one of them, asked, Our law does not judge people without first giving them a hearing to find out what they are doing, does it? They replied, Surely you are not also from Galilee, are you? Search, and you will see that no prophet is to arise from Galilee. The Gospel of the Lord. Will you please pray with me? Good and gracious God, we give you thanks as always, but we give you thanks today that you are living water for us. And as we drink in your Holy Spirit today, your word, we ask that you would lead and guide us along these living waters, that you would be with each and every one of us today. And God, help us to be in your presence, right here and right now. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, we have, uh, maybe as you know, been making our way through the Gospel of John each week for the last number of weeks, and I really hope that you've been able to follow along with us each week because it's been a great kind of journey through this Gospel. Um, if you haven't been able to do that, I would love to invite you to jump in and read John's gospel. If you read one chapter a day for the next week, you'd be all caught up by next weekend. So we'd love to have you do that with us. Um, it's a great gospel. It's actually uh, my favorite of the four gospels for a lot of reasons. But uh, one of the reasons is that John has this great way of um, digging into the good news of Jesus and giving us a, a grand picture of what that looks like. And so um, I love to not only read this gospel, I love to preach on it. And the last time I was up here to preach a few weeks ago, um, I said that the best thing to me about preaching through a book of the Bible like this is the connection you get to make from week to week. So I'm going to try to do that today. I'm going to try to make a connection for you for the weeks past and the, the weeks to come, and hopefully somehow this piece of the story will fit right in there, and you can see eventually that this story of God, the story of Jesus, is actually your story too. This is your story. You can find yourself in it. You can find yourself in the good news of God in this story. And what's wonderful to me about that is that God's story, when you find yourself in it, begins to not only be uh, a part of yours, but your story, your life story, will actually start to take shape in a different way. Because that's the power of God's word. God's word will shape your life. It will transform your life. And so uh, I encourage you to read along with us. And um, I want to dig in today about how this gospel lesson from John chapter 7, will shape our story. What does it have to say? What is God saying to us? And how does this story shape us? Well, uh, I have to start with this confession. 
Um, this week was a challenge for me to get ready for this sermon. I was uh, in our staff meeting on Tuesday, and I read the, read the passage that we heard Lois read this morning, and as I read it, I asked the staff to kind of jump in, and I said, you guys, you really need to help me with my sermon this week, because I am struggling here. I don't know what to make of this, and um, you know what? They weren't very helpful. So, what did I do? I went to the men's Bible study on Wednesday morning at 6.30, and I said, guys, we're preaching on John chapter 7 this week, and I need your help because I have no idea what to do. And you know what? They weren't very helpful either. They're cooking breakfast this morning for you, so they've redeemed themselves a little bit with bacon. But um, then I had to go... Uh, Thursday night, I was leading Pastor Tim's Bible study for him. He's on vacation for a couple of weeks, and uh, I jumped in there, and I said, you know what, you all, you, you really need to help me this time, because I've tried at the staff meeting, I've tried at men's Bible study, and I need some help with my sermon, and you know what? They were really helpful, but we didn't even get to John chapter 7, so I was stuck. I was stuck, and I was trying to figure out what to preach and so I finally uh, sat down on, thir on Friday and I worked on my message a little bit and then I scrapped that and I sat down on Saturday morning and I was working on my message a little bit. My family's running around and pretty soon my in-laws are staying with us. They take the kids to the park and I got some quiet time to just sit and think about this story. What is happening in John's Gospel? at this point in the story. Well, that's where it really started to get interesting to me, and I really started picking up what I thought would be helpful for all of us. So if you go back a few weeks, and you can go back and watch our sermons online, but you'll remember a few parts of the story. Some major themes are starting to pop up in this uh, Gospel of John. First of all, Jesus has performed a few signs or miracles. He's done things like turning water into wine. You'll remember that, the wedding at Cana, right? He's healed some people, a royal official's son. Uh, he wasn't even in the same room or even in the same city, and Jesus was able to miraculously heal this royal official's son. And then you have the, this great miracle of Jesus feeding 5,000 people, right, with just two fish and five loaves of bread. Incredible miracle. And then in the story, you also have these kind of interesting, long dialogues that Jesus has. He's got these dialogues with people, people like the woman at the well. You remember that part of the story. Jesus interacts with this woman who he probably never should have been seen with, and there he is, broad daylight, having a conversation with the woman at the well. And then Jesus has this incredible conversation with this Pharisee named Nicodemus. Fascinating uh, conversation because Nicodemus, he's so interested in Jesus, even though all the Pharisees around are trying to attack Jesus, find out the, the weaknesses in his uh, ch uh, chain mail, in the armor of Jesus. They're, they're looking for ways to find out uh, a weakness in Jesus' message and what he's doing, right? But here's Nicodemus, this Pharisee, and he's curious, he's interested, he's seeking Jesus. And then Jesus also has in Go John's Gospel these outrageous claims about who he is and what he's about. He says things like, I am the bread of life. Your ancestors ate manna in the wilderness, but I am bread, and I am bread of life. And Jesus goes on and he says in our uh, gospel lesson for today, I am the Messiah. I am the Messiah, these outrageous claims. And when he uses that little word, I am, those little words, I am, he's actually using in Greek the, the Hebrew um, translation is ego a me, but Hebrew is Yahweh, which is God's name. Jesus says, I am Yahweh. I am God. Outrageous, bold claims. And so with all of that in the background, these miracles, these interactions, these bold interactions, Jesus making outrageous claims, you get to our story for today. 
And you can feel the tension is starting to build for Jesus. He's got all of these religious authorities around him, and he's starting to get into really hot water with them. And so pretty soon they're angry enough that they want Jesus arrested. So they call the temple police, and they demand to have Jesus bound and brought to prison. And the temple police are after Jesus because all of that tension has been building up in the background. As I was sitting there yesterday morning thinking about this, I thought, you know what's really interesting here? Is that Jesus isn't hiding out or running from the temple police in our lesson for today. We're told at the beginning of our lesson, Jesus is at a festival in the temple in Jerusalem. He's there with all the people gathered around, all the Jews coming to Jerusalem to celebrate a week of a huge festival. And he's not hiding out from the temple police. He's there in the temple teaching and speaking, and he's talking to people and interacting with them, and all of the religious authorities and the temple police, they're sort of standing on the sidelines, listening, waiting to trap him in some kind of bold claim or outrageous claim about who he is or some bold miracle that he is going to do. They're just waiting for Jesus to make a mistake. So John chapter 7 tells us Jesus is in Jerusalem for this festival. The festival is called the Festival of Booths or the Festival of Tabernacles. It's a festival that the Jews would celebrate, still do today actually, a festival to remind them of the way that God provides for them in their lives, particularly the way that God provided for them as they wandered in the wilderness. The festival would have the Jews setting up these Uh, tents or tabernacles or booths to remind themselves of moving around in the wilderness and being and relying on God's provisions as they're out there in the wilderness and so they have this festival for seven days in Jerusalem at the temple setting up these booths now one of my seminary professors reminded me this week that this celebration this festival is actually a harvest festival They would celebrate it in October. And after all of the produce from the growing season had been harvested, the olives, the grapes, the wheat, the fruit of the trees, everything that they had grown was gathered in, the Jewish people would travel to Jerusalem to celebrate this abundant harvest and God's providing for them each and every day. And one of the things that would also happen at this festival is that they would pray for rain for water, for the next season of planting and growing, because at this point in the year, the land was dry and dusty and parched. And so they would pray for water, for planting and growing for the next year. And for seven days, the temple put, uh, priests, they would wander around the temple, and they'd be holding these pieces of fruit in their hands and praying to God and and singing Psalm 118, save us, O Lord, we beg you, save us, O Lord, give us success in our growing. And when that part of the ceremony ended, the priests, they'd go up to the altar and they'd grab this golden pitcher, this golden pitcher, they'd walk down to the Pool of Siloam, and you're going to hear about the Pool of Siloam in a couple of weeks, so pay attention to what happens here. They'd go down to this pool in the temple courtyard, they'd dip this golden pitcher into the water, and just like they did with the fruit, they would wander around the courtyards, pouring the water out on the dry and dusty ground, praying to God as they went. And they would pray these words from Zechariah chapter 14. Listen to these words that they would pray. On the last day, they would pray, living waters shall flow out from Jerusalem. As they would dump the water on the ground, they would say, on the last day, living waters 
would flow out from Jerusalem. Now, I want you to get this tension here. Imagine all of this has happened with Jesus, right? The miracles, the bold claims, the kind of outrageous conversations he's had, and in comes Jesus to this festival at the temple as the priests are praying these prayers. And on the last day of the festival, a special prayer, this special prayer, Zechariah 14, on the last day, living waters flow out of Jerusalem. As the priest is pouring out the water, praying this prayer, Jesus stands up in the middle of the celebration, and he says, let anyone who comes to me drink. Let anyone who is thirsty come to me. The scriptures have said, out of his heart shall flow rivers of living water. You see what Jesus does there? He takes this prayer from Zechariah 14 that the priests are praying, and he says, out of his heart shall flow rivers of living water. Not out of Jerusalem, out of his heart. His heart, out of his heart shall flow rivers of living water. Can you see why this story is so powerful? Can you see what Jesus is doing? He's saying, I am the living water that you've been praying for for thousands of years. I'm the one you've been waiting for, the one who will nourish your life, the one who will quench your thirst your thirst for truth, your thirst for life. I am he, Jesus says. Now at this point in the the season, the ground, of course, would have been dry and dusty, right? Yesterday, we had this incredible windstorm. I don't know if any of you were driving around, but if you were out here on 57th Street or Highway 11, the wind was just blowing the dust across the road. You could hardly see the other side of the road. I went out and took a video. Uh, we, we live on a little acreage uh, uh, south of town here, and I went out and took a video of how dry it is for you, so I want you to just take a look at that for a second. This crack that you're looking at in our pro- on our property, it's about three inches wide, and if you look down to the bottom of the crack, it's 18 to 24 inches deep. And I know that it's even more dry in some places in South Dakota, but as I was sitting there yesterday morning writing my sermon, I thought, you know, I wonder if Jerusalem was as dry and dusty as that. As dry and dusty as it is in South Dakota right now. Right? And then it got me thinking about all this stuff going on in Jerusalem at the time of Jesus and dry and dusty ground and Jesus saying, I am living water. And all of a sudden it dawned on me, I wonder if this is a metaphor. Somebody last night said, maybe it's not even a metaphor, maybe this is just real life, but I wonder if this is a metaphor for our lives. We're dry and dusty lives. You know what I'm talking about? Those times when things get so dry and dusty, when our faith life has become so dry and dusty, we've just kind of been moving along in life and expecting there to be water there and expecting that our lives are going to be just fine and you know, wouldn't you know it, pretty soon we're realizing, wow, my life of faith, it's really gotten kind of dry and dusty over the years. And then something happens, something happens significantly, and that dry and dusty faith life, it just sort of cracks open. It sort of cracks open, and pretty soon you start to notice the cracks all over in your life, and you're kind of wondering, man, I wonder if there's anything more to this life. I wonder if there's anything more to this life that I'm living. I need some living water. I need something 
to water this dry and dusty soil of my life. Isn't it so often true that our lives become complacent? That we forget to drink from the water of life, the living water, that river of life that flows from the heart of Jesus. I wonder if you've ever cruised along in your life just sort of going to work, going to school, going along in your family life and things are getting sort of dry and dusty and then you have that moment when it just cracks open and you're waiting for living water. And so if you can imagine it, imagine in the middle of your life, Jesus stands up and he says, I am living water for you. I'm the one that you've been waiting for. All of those prayers in your life that you've been praying, the ones for meaning and purpose and value, something to give your life nourishment and goodness, I am the one you've been praying for. I am living water for you. For your dry and parched and maybe even cracked open life, I'm here. Can you see Jesus in that way? Standing up in the middle of your life and saying, I will give you nourishment. I will quench every thirst for truth and meaning and purpose you've ever had, and I will give you something powerful to do with your life. By the power of my Holy Spirit, right now, right here in this place, I will give you living water. That's my prayer for you today, that you will know the living water of Jesus Christ in your life, now and always. In the name of Jesus, amen.